Hello and welcome again to Why Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups organized by the UCD Center for War Studies. The papers in this session will examine the activities and motivations of paramilitaries. We often think of war as the business of standing armies, but a lot of armed conflict actually involves men and women who are not regular soldiers. This panel will examine the role of paramilitary groups in extending or limiting the reach of organized state power. Our next speaker is Efrosini Panayot, a PhD candidate here at UCD. Efrosini's research explores decolonization in Cyprus and the Mediterranean region. In this paper, Efrosini will consider how the activities of Greek Cypriot nationalist paramilitaries were shaped by the objective of Enosis, or union with mainland Greece. How did armed struggle promote the nationalist cause, and how does Enosis relate to post-colonial political thought more broadly? These are just some of the questions that Efrosini addresses in her very interesting paper. Evening from Manchester, everyone. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to explore why Greek Cypriots took up arms against the British in the 1950s. Uh, the armed campaign in question was waged by a guerrilla organization called EOCA, which stands for the National Organization of Cypriot Fighters. Uh, as a result, this period is known as the EOCA struggle, though it was labeled by the British as the Cyprus Emergency. Uh, this uprising is naturally considered as one of the most significant milestones in the island's history. Uh, there is therefore no shortage of research on the topic. Um, anything related to the events or the proceedings is therefore heavily informed by the work of a variety of other historians, but the analytical points regarding the role of political ideology um, are where the focus is. So let's start with the ideological foundations for the EOCA struggle. Uh, it's important to note that the EOCA campaign did not come out of the blue, even if that is how the British government reacted to it. There were a number of previous telling developments, both at the local level with localised rebellions and a referendum, and on the international level with appeals to the UN. Uh, unlike most other anti-colonial insurrections of this period, however, the political idea which inspired the uprising was not independence or autonomy, but enosis. This term is the Greek word for union or unification. In this context, it denotes the unification of Cyprus with Greece. Enosis is a political idea with a long history and with a near ubiquitous resonance among the Greek population of Cyprus at this time. It's undoubtedly a nationalist idea and the narrative surrounding it has anti-colonial characteristics as well from earlier on, but particularly during the conflict. Uh, this idea continued to develop alongside military activities and it was expressed in a number of different ways. My objective here is to use this idea as the starting point for our discussion in relation to the violence that was waged to achieve it. When it comes to the Aoka struggle, Enosis appears to act as both the motivation towards violence and as the desired political outcome of violence. Uh, the primary sources through which it is possible to trace this development are mainly the numerous EOCA pamphlets, which were widely circulated at the time. This was the way through which EOCA stayed connected with the local population, maintaining its already widespread popular support among the Greeks of the island. This is particularly interesting for historians because in this way, EOCA acquired its own separate political voice, despite essentially being the military wing of a pre-existing political body. Uh, more specifically, whilst purely civilian control was only asserted in Cyprus by the local British colonial authorities, the local Greeks already had their own political leadership, namely the collective structure of the Greek Orthodox Church, which was known in Cyprus as the Ethnarchy, meaning leaders of the nation. The ideological foundations of Enesis, and by extension the Eoka struggle itself, therefore stemmed from the authority of the Archbishop. It is worth noting that multiple historians have pointed out that this link was perhaps not as, a, not as unavoidable as one would assume. Enosis had actually been espoused by a variety of forces across the political spectrum in Cyprus, including most notably by the local Communist Party. So the idea of Enosis, and more importantly, its associated popularity, had become the proverbial bone of contention between conflicting political voices, it was just a question of who would be entrusted by the public to achieve it. When it came to an armed uprising against the British, it is clear that the ethnarchy won. The church leadership was therefore articulating Enosis as the ideological basis of the uprising, 
and did so extensively through speeches, newspapers, events and radio. Consequently, anyone joining EOKA had to swear a religious oath, numerous EOKA fighters had been members of a Christian youth organisation, and many were very religious individuals themselves. In fact, EOKA was actually secretly founded by a committee led by the then ethnarch Archbishop Makarios. This committee then conducted extensive research to find an appropriate leader for EOKA, eventually choosing a Cypriot Greek army officer named Georgios Grivas. Despite the fact that these proceedings were clouded in secrecy, the British were certain throughout the duration of the Eoka struggle that Grivas directly reported to Archbishop Makarios. As a result, after failed negotiations with the local British government following the outbreak of the struggle, the Archbishop and a number of other officials were exiled from the island in 1956. This is when Grivas gave the order for Eoka to found its own separate political committee responsible for maintaining the lines of communication with the public open. Once again, through the circulation of pamphlets, this committee was essentially stepping in to the perceived gap that the Archbishop's absence would leave, so as not to risk losing their widespread popular support. This shows how the armed military side of the struggle was willing and able to directly engage with the political realm with no intermediaries needed this becomes particularly pertinent nearing the end of this period when the political developments begin to take a direction with which the members of EOKA themselves do not agree. Now that we've addressed the purpose, let's look at the content of said pamphlets more closely. Interestingly, while there can be no doubt that Enosis was the objective of both the ethnarchy and EOKA, you will be hard pressed to find the word itself anywhere in the pamphlets. The reasons why Cypriots had taken up arms are replaced with words such as freedom and liberation, and with terms such as self-determination. Historians have identified this as a tactic meant to break the links between Enosis and traditional 19th century style nationalism and irredentism, and to emphasize instead the increasingly recognized right to self-determination. The use of this language was politically expedient, as all these terms were essentially seen as synonymous with Enosis anyway, I would agree that this was certainly a tactical choice by EOKA, made with a clear strategic goal in mind. The audience of multiple pamphlets, for example, is explicitly named as the international community, the UN or the British themselves. That said, this was not always the case. In fact, a multitude of EOKA pamphlets, when addressing the local population in particular, clearly demonstrate the opposite desire, namely to maintain the link with 19th century Greek nationalism. They also simultaneously draw parallels to the armed resistance against the Nazi occupation of Greece in the 1940s. In essence, it was actually extremely important to the Enesis narrative for the EOKA campaign to be seen as part of an existing continuous process, as the natural next step in a long and just, and just historical struggle whose previous iterations had been widely accepted and supported. When exploring political or diplomatic contexts in intellectual history, it's easy to underestimate the power of symbolism. On this occasion, such portrayals appear to have been crucial in capturing the imagination of both local and international observers. I now want to go on to my next point, which is the political ambitions and activities of Aoka's fighters and its leader in particular. It is usually prudent to avoid personality-led approaches to intellectual history, particularly in cases like this, where the ideological foundation of the struggle predates and supersedes any particular individual. That said, there can be no question Grivas himself effectively defined the Eoka struggle, and this was recognised by those within it and outside of it. For example, in a letter to Grivas seized by the British, the deputy leader of Eoka, who had also served in the Greek army, urges Grivas to be more careful with his movements because whilst they could withstand losing five or ten fighters, if Grivas himself were captured or killed, then the entire struggle would fizzle out and everything would be lost. Due to the experience of Grivas himself, Eoka had a recognisably military structure, a fact that the British had every reason to vehemently challenge and deny. Grivas was an active officer in the Greek army since 1919, with a long service record. As a result, EOKA functioned as a clear, top-down hierarchy, which Gorivas describes in great detail in his memoir. This structure was adapted for regional variations, even in a small place like Cyprus, 
because Rivas knew that military tactics would differ from location to location. The island was separated into 12 sectors, each with a designated leader reporting to Rivas. The guerrilla groups that operated in the rural or mountainous regions of the island, on the other hand, had their own leaders also reporting to Rivas. Rivas was able to coordinate this intricate network through coded communications, often transported between locations by uninitiated yet sympathetic members of the public. Moreover, every fighter was given a pseudonym to avoid captured communications, revealing the fighter's actual identities. While the British were aware of Rivas' identity, he became known and was referred to by the general public by his pseudonym, the Yenis, which is also how he signed the Eoka pamphlets. In the pamphlet issued on the one-year anniversary of the Eoka campaign, he described the insurrection as a revolution. He also called Eoka an army in his subsequent memoir. That said, Eoka was far from what can be described as a regular army, and Rivas' most recent experience of conflict was not in the context of regular war either. If I'm allowed a small digression, it's worth mentioning that in the 1940s in Axis-occupied Athens, Rivas was a leader of a small royalist resistance group called He, comprised mainly of former professional soldiers. It was likely his combined experience of leading both a regular army and an irregular militia, which contributed to his selection as the most appropriate leader for Eoka. Rivas' personal dislike towards the British Allied forces, who were still occupying the island of his birth, intensified in 1943 due to their refusal to support he in the same way they supported left-wing resistance groups in Greece. The British subsequently changed their approach by the end of 1944, drawn to he due to its military structure as a tool against communism. Let us end this digression by noting that, though both led by Rivas, EOKA was a very different organisation to he for two main reasons. The first is that EOKA was fully embedded in and supported by the local Greek community in Cyprus, primarily because Enosis was its, was its political objective. The second is that the vast majority of its members had no military experience whatsoever. They ranged from university students to farmers and from accountants to school teachers. Over the four or so years when EOKA was active, its fighters engaged in a variety of military activities, ranging from arson, sabotage and targeted assassinations to bombings, hour-long military standoffs and direct gunfights. In the Eoka pamphlets, Rivas makes repeated references to the Cypriot youth as the reason why the struggle is bound to succeed. Indeed, Eoka had its own youth organisation, which mobilised student protests and circulated their own pamphlets, which did not hesitate to mention Enesis as their goal. Perhaps a valuable alternative source, which can help reveal the state of mind of individual fighters, is the letters that captured Eoka fighters who had been condemned to death wrote to their family and friends prior to their executions. The tone of these letters ranges from proud and defiant to humble and calm, and also does not shy away from identifying the noble reason of their upcoming sacrifice. Their motivations for fighting relate to Enosis, a metaphor for their nationality, their religion and the fate of their homeland. As for Rivas himself, he was seen as a fervent anti-communist since the 1940s, and in the Eoka pamphlets from the 1950s, he condemned the leadership of the Communist Party for failing to openly support the armed struggle and for arguing for political approaches instead. He also, on occasion, defends Eoka's executions of prominent trade unionists because they were traitors to the cause of Enosis. Rivas himself welcomed prominent members of the left who joined Eoka, some of whom also anonymously criticised the Communist Party for its stance. At the same time, however, a declaration captured by the British before the struggle erupted in 1955 appears to encourage known communists to stay away from EOKA, if they really cared about Enosis, as their participation risked the local decolonization movement being dismissed as a communist threat, therefore losing its support at the UN. Whether this was actually because of the aforementioned anti-communist ideology, or whether it was indeed a tactical decision because the EOKA leadership understood the risk their operations would run if the British were able to characterise the uprising as a communist threat is a matter of ongoing debate. Nonetheless, it is important to remember that the idea of Enosis does not inherently carry this ideological burden at this stage. It is the EOKA struggle itself, the eruption into violence, that caused this division.
To this day, the local Communist Party commemorates its members that were executed by EOKA and identifies the guerrilla group as its historical enemy, perhaps more so than they ever did the British. And finally, let's look at how this political objective of Enosis relates to some common themes found in wider anti-colonial political thought. We've already discussed that the leaders of EOKA were acutely aware of international developments and sought to adapt their operations accordingly. Another element of ideology which impacted tactical operations was that of the indigenous element fighting against foreign invaders. Specific EOKA tactics, from urban escape routes to dug up hideouts on the side of mountains, were very much symbolic of their fighters' intimate knowledge of their own land and terrain against the ignorance of British forces. What we have also not addressed is that, regardless of who the target of specific military operations was, the enemy was always identified in the rhetoric as the British and their imperialist policies. Neither Makarios nor Grivas thought it was possible to achieve a military victory against tens of thousands of heavily armed and rigorously trained British soldiers. After all, there were only about 250 to 300 active EOGA fighters at any given time, and despite the support from the local population, they did not stand a chance against mass arrests, curfews, concentration camps, incarcerations, torture and executions. EOKA's purpose was purely political. The aim of its violence was to put pressure on Britain to negotiate with the ethnarchy and withdraw from Cyprus so that Enosis could be achieved. As for the British leadership itself, they had historically refused to engage with calls for them to abandon Cyprus and they rejected EOKA's purpose of freedom or self-determination. They had also historically either refused to acknowledge that the objective of Enosis existed at all, or when they did, they disregarded it as nativist chauvinism and condemned it as a divisive ideology. The British objective, in other words, was to deny the international validation that EOKA sought so insistently at every step, and to reject any description of it as a military or revolutionary organisation. British propaganda characterised EOKA as a terrorist organisation instead, and emphasised not just the British victims of the struggle, but also local Greek and Turkish victims. Grivas similarly includes explicit photos of numerous tortured, maimed or executed victims of the British in his own memoir. A useful example of how British propaganda machine operates arises in 1956, when colonial authorities located what appears to have been Rivas's diary since 1954. Despite intelligence sources advising against it, the local government rushes to publish these documents in 1957 with the title Terrorism in Cyprus. This diary reveals detailed plans for the start of the struggle, Grivas' disappointment or even suspicion towards some of his collaborators, his anger towards Greek politicians who condemned Eoka's violence, and it also reveals how embittered he was towards the British and their false promises of victory and freedom during World War II. In his memoirs, Grivas acknowledges the originality of these documents, but appears to have doubts about certain sections which may have been tampered with or forged. Coming to the end of this period, it becomes apparent that the reason why Cypriots fought may not have been on the negotiating table at all. Political and diplomatic history has conducted extensive research of the various solution plans and the interests of the various involved powers, though this is not the topic of this presentation. Enosis, this idea that informed the Eoka struggle, predates it by several decades and survives it for a number of years, as even after the end of the struggle it was not achieved, despite the Eoka campaign being celebrated as successful for ending British occupation of Cyprus. The final pamphlet circulated by Eoka and signed by Rivas is particularly informative. He asks the fighters to stand down in order to avoid a national division. He calls for an end to the war and he states that the struggle continues with peaceful means. He urges unity and love and wholehearted support for the ethnarch Archbishop Makarios. To conclude, it seems commonly accepted across academia that the stated reasons of why people fight, whether we are talking about state or non-state actors, cannot be taken at face value. In the case of EOKA, there is no doubt they fought for Enosis. Now what that meant in practice, freedom, national fulfilment, personal success or economic prosperity, is an entirely different matter. I'd like to finish by emphasising that this is merely a snapshot of what is admittedly a heavily studied and rather complex period about which conflicting interpretations abound.
This is the first time I've had the opportunity to attend such a conference and I hope that I've been able to give you all an overview from a hopefully different perspective. I look forward to more in-depth discussions on some of the themes mentioned here when the opportunity arises. I would welcome all of your thoughts, questions and feedback. Thank you.